Good evening and welcome everyone to this month's Heritage Hour session, Beneath the Surface, Exploring Goa's Marine Ecosystem. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for the evening, Venkatesh Charlu. A banker by profession, Venkat worked in Hong Kong for 11 years before starting recreational scuba diving in Goa in 1995 with Barracuda Diving India. He is passionate about marine conservation and founded Coastal Impact with the intention of building awareness about marine ecosystems and motivating people to become divers and ocean ambassadors, as well as to join in to save Goa's precious marine life. He is one of the most highly qualified dive instructors in India and has been diving for the last 30 years. We are very excited to have you here with us today, Vankat. Uh, before Thank I hand you. To before I hand over to Vengert, I would like to request everyone in the audience to please keep your videos turned off and have yourselves on mute during the course of the talk. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the talk, and I would like to request everyone to please drop your questions in the chat box, or alternatively, you can raise your hands using the button at the bottom of your screen and unmute yourself when asked to do so. Okay, over to you, Vengert. Thank you. My pleasure to be invited by Muka today. To talk to all of you. So uh, uh, basically, uh, it's my uh, endeavor would be to get you interested in marine conservation, which is uh, such a need of the hour uh, topic at the moment because a lot of our uh, very own survival depends on uh, the oceans. So. I'll start a video session, uh, sorry, a slideshow session, essentially showing you the beauty of the ocean first, followed by the state of the oceans at the moment. And then finally, rounding off with what each and every one of us individually and collectively as well can do. Okay, so hope you enjoy it. Let me share the screen. Okay, so this is a program which uh, I developed essentially for schools and colleges and uh, essentially for students from seventh standard upwards because uh, under the assumption that of course they would have a little bit of uh, information already at hand on the issues which are happening nowadays. So hopefully, uh, of course, if you have any questions like uh, was already mentioned, you can ask me at the end of the session. So basically, we are an NGO which uh, is primarily involved in uh, marine conservation, education, and research. So this forms a part of the education process, uh, education for that we do for the uh, schools. And uh, the other company, which is considerably older here, it shows 27 years, but actually now it's going to be 30 years is Barracuda Diving India, which is owned by me. And it's essentially to teach people how to dive and enjoy. And also whoever has got a certificate, they can also come to us and dive for pleasure. So what do we do? Uh, like I said, we spread awareness uh, through education and slideshows. We also help scientists in their surveys, NGOs, government research organizations. So. Underwater surveys is what uh, we are good at. And I've done surveys all along the coast of India from uh, Maharashtra right down to Kerala at the end and also in Tamil Nadu. Um, Long-term goals, of course, we wanted to start this NGO because we wanted to make a difference and we don't want to do the same projects which others are doing. So we are concentrating on projects which involve scuba diving and also which are a little uh, different from what the others are already do. So that's what is our focus. We have quite a few advisors on our panel because me, I myself am not a marine biologist. I do have two marine biologists working for me. I'll give you an introduction to them in a bit. But basically these are uh, quite famous people uh, Aaron Lobo is one of the favorite sons of Goa. He's a marine biologist and a herpetologist um, who has uh, completed his education on scholarship in Cambridge University in UK. Uh, Dr. Mrs. Chandralata Raghukumar and her husband, uh, Dr. Sheshagiri Raghukumar, both are ex-NIO. So they are actually marine biologists who have now retired, but they help me out whenever I need 
uh, help uh, for their help. Yeah. Dr. Robert Sluka is actually from USA, but he was posted in uh, Kerala. Rather, he was helping an NGO in Kerala for quite a while, and that's how I met him. And he was the first one who actually taught me how to do marine surveys and uh, also gave me a lot of valuable insight into oh, how to do it. Yeah. Last one, Dr. Sajita Thomas is a senior scientist with uh, CMFRI, that is Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute in Mangalore. And uh, she's very senior. I've had the honor of helping her on many of her surveys in Goa, as well as in Netrani Island in Karnataka. So let's start with trying to keep you awake. Uh, I'll be peppering this uh, presentation with some quizzes. They're quite easy, but if you don't know it, it's not a big deal. You can at least learn uh, what you don't know. So how much of the Earth's surface is covered by water? Now, obviously, on a forum, a net forum like this, I don't want to stop for answers because I'm sure there'll be dozens of you putting your hands up. So let me go ahead and give the answer. Well, 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, right? So actually, Blue Planet would be a better name instead of Earth. How many oceans are there? And can you name them? I'm sure you're getting this, but I have a surprise for you at the end of this. So there is actually only one global ocean, right? The boundaries are given by countries and the uh, continents which are uh, bordering these, but essentially when you think about it, there's only one global ocean because they are all connected. Which is bigger? Mount Everest, which is the tallest mountain, or Mariana's Trench, which is the deepest point in the ocean? So you can see the answer for yourself by almost 3,000 odd meters, the deepest point in Earth meets Mount Everest. So if you take the entire Mount Everest and stick it uh, into Mariana Strange, there'll still be a mile of water above it, which is three and a half, almost 3.3 .3 kilometers. Yeah. Uh, the sad thing is, even in the Mariana Strange, we have discovered plastic. So that tells you the extent of the problem of plastic. So let's talk about the beauty of the oceans. I'm sure quite a few of you have joined, uh, have uh, watched Discovery Channel or National Geographic and various other channels, Animal Planet, etc. which show you a lot of documentaries on diving and on marine life. But trust me, there is nothing which, which prepares you for actually seeing it first time. So, I have a few cool facts here at the left-hand top corner. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef in the world and can actually be seen with the naked eye from space, from the moon. But it is in deep trouble. If you've been following the news recently, a lot of it is getting bleached again. It has already happened a few years ago. But now it is pretty serious because we are already just in April, which is not even the peak of summer, and it's already bleaching, and it's looking to be a very severe case of bleaching, which is spreading all across the world and creating problems for the coral reefs. So, as you can see from the photographs here, corals are really, really beautiful. Uh, primarily, there are two categories. One is the soft coral, which you see on the left-hand side, and then the hard coral, which is on the top right uh, slide. There are hundreds, if not, there are actually thousands of corals uh, species, and they play a vital role in uh, the well-being of the oceans. So we'll come to that in a minute. This is a sea fan, which is uh, belongs to the soft coral family also. So there they feed, you can see the polyps all extended. They feed on the in the current, 
on my tiny microorganisms. So coral reefs are home to millions of uh, species of fish, coral, various, all kinds of things. And uh, they are very, very important in the entire ecosystem because even though they only occupy about 0. 0.00 something, 1% of the oceans, they are responsible for sheltering, feeding, and taking care of almost 25% of the known species, uh, the total known species. So that is a very big number. Yeah. Now, as of now, scientists have uh, studied and kind of discovered almost 40,000 species of fish. Okay? And this is increasing every day. So it's not a fixed number yet. There are many, many, many more species that we don't know. As quite a few of the scientists say, you know, the, we have studied more of the surface of the moon than we know about our ocean planet because it's quite deep and it's very difficult to get to some places and also to make uh, a studied survey on all that. So, but people are doing it and it is increasing by the day now because we realize there's so many things underwater which we don't know about. And so it's a constant challenge for the scientists. Now here you have got the angelfish, which is very, very beautiful. There are many, many species of angelfish. And uh, they are basically uh, found in every ocean on the earth. And uh, many, I mean, there may be some species which are endemic to certain areas. That means they are found only in that area. But in general, you'll always find at least a few dozen species of angelfish wherever you go in the world. Uh, below that is your well-known friend Nemo from uh, the movie Nemo. But he actually belongs to a species of fish called the anemone fish. Now they live in anemones and there are many different types of anemones and therefore there are many different types of anemone fish. So the Nemo is actually only one type of 75 different types of uh, fish of that species. Yeah. The interesting thing about Nemo is that all uh, anemone fish are actually born female. And as they grow, they become males. Uh, when the largest female, sorry, when the male in the colony dies, the largest female changes sex and takes over that. That's an amazing fact, but that's not isolated only to anemone fish. There are many types of fish, like the groupers, the parrotfish, etc., which are able to change their sex. To shock you even further, out of the 40,000 different species of fish, almost 10% of the fish can actually do this. But even more interesting is that out of that 10%, there is a smaller percentage of fish which can actually go back to their original sex. How freaky is that? Yeah. So... The next one, I'm sure all of you recognize this. This is the seahorse. And there are quite a few species of seahorse in the oceans. Amazing thing about seahorses is that the males carry the eggs in the pouch, right? And uh, they take care of the eggs until they hatch. So uh, technically, they are called the, the fathers deliver the babies, but actually it's not the fact. It's only the fertilized eggs which are taken care of him until they hatch. So, answer I've already given you. What can a seahorse do that no other animal on the planet can? And there you go. Okay, It releases fully formed miniature seahorses which look exactly like the parents. As little as five, as many as 1,500. But remember, the mortality rate is very high in seahorses. So a lot of them do not make it to adulthood, unfortunately. These are oceanic mantas. Manta rays, amazingly, are actually related to sharks. There are more than 550 different types of sharks, out of which uh, all the species of rays belong also 
to the shark family. So manta rays look huge. They can grow as much as seven meters across and weigh as much as two tons, which is 2,000 kilos, but they're harmless, they're totally gentle. Now, to give you a few more cool facts, the blue whale is the largest animal that has ever lived on Earth. They are bigger than the biggest dinosaurs that ever lived. So you can imagine that's seriously big. And they're known to be up, uh, to grow up to about 30 to 32 meters in length, which is more than 100 feet. And each blue whale can weigh a full adult, fully grown adult can grow the size and weight of, sorry, weight of 40 fully grown elephants or approximately 2,667 humans, each weighing 70 kilos, right? So that's, that's and the good news is that they have recovered from the brink of extinction and they are alive and well, even very close to India, near Sri Lanka, where uh, student of mine actually posted a video uh, just the day before yesterday where he was actually snorkeling with the blue whales. So they are very alive, very much alive and alive. Yeah. Below that is the largest fish. So you have to remember the whale is a mammal, an air breathing species which has to come up to breathe, correct? A blue, uh, uh, the biggest fish, the mantle goes to the whale shark, which is, uh, which grows to about 18 meters. And believe me, when you see it underwater, it looks huge. It looks like a submarine coming towards you. I was recently in Indonesia and we were, we had the good fortune of actually snorkeling with the whale sharks. It's quite an awesome experience. Yeah. The next, the smallest one in the fish family is the dwarf gobi, which is less than 10 centimeters. Really, really small. Okay, so you can see the smallest and then the biggest. There's so much of difference between the two. Okay. On the extreme right, you can see a colony of jellyfish. There are reported to be more than thousands of jellyfish in the oceans, but the scientists say that there are actually many more thousands of species which have not even been discovered yet. So you can imagine how many there are underwater and they are an animal which has no brain, no eyes, no mouth. Basically, they have no uh, organs at all. So they take in their food from a, a, a hole over here at the bottom and they also excrete from the same place. Uh, not all jellyfish are poisonous. Quite a few species are totally harmless. There are certain species which can actually be almost fatal to humans. Sharks. Everybody is afraid of sharks, but actually there's no reason to be afraid of them. Out of the 550 species I talked to you about, only about five or six are known to be dangerous to humans. And you really have to be very unfortunate to be in the wrong place at the wrong time to be attacked by one. Um, all over the world, there are only about four or five recorded attacks by sharks on humans. So you can see it's very, very rare. Whereas 100 million sharks are being killed by us every year. So you figure out who's more dangerous. Yeah. Uh, the great white shark, which is shown in the top left, is known to be the most dangerous animal in the sea. But actually, that's not true anymore because near South Africa, there are killer whales, which are orcas, which go, which are attacking the great whites and actually killing them and eating certain parts of their organs. Yeah. So quite a few great whites have been killed in the last few months by orcas. Below that are the nurse sharks, uh, sorry, the white tip sharks, which are basically reef sharks. Same as the shark shown here, but these are the black tip, oceanic black tips. Yeah. So the oceanic varieties get fairly bigger, 
in size. The reef sharks are generally smaller. And reef sharks are territorial, so they tend to stay in the same area. Yeah, whereas bigger sharks are pelagics and they wander all over the oceans looking for food all the time. Okay. So are sharks protected in India? There are reported to be almost 160 species of sharks found in Indian waters, of which only about 10 are legally protected. And even those are not protected to the full extent because there is no monitoring, right? That is the sad part. So people just go and kill them. And uh, mostly they're used for shark fins, which actually is banned in India, but they are allowed to be exported as a whole fish. And unfortunately, the fins are what most people are interested in because they're very, very expensive and they're used in. Shark fin soup, mostly. Okay, so whale sharks were the first ones to be granted protection in India, and that happened in Gujarat, where even now they are very actively protected. If a whale shark gets into a fishing net, the fishermen are paid a lot of money to cut the nets and free them. So a lot of sharks have been freed since this program was introduced by the Indian government and it is enforced by the forest department. The ocean is filled not just with fish. There are so many more animals, mammals, birds, etc., which live in the ocean. For example, you've got the whale, which, like I told you, is not a mammal, uh, sorry, is a mammal, not a fish. So you have plenty of whales in the ocean. You have animals like the polar bear, which go into the sea and they're actually found hundreds of kilometers far from ice flows and land where they hunt for fish etc then you have penguins which also actively fish they're called flightless birds uh, but they're amazingly graceful under everybody knows dolphins dolphins are also mammals which live all their lives in the oceans and they also have wide coverage area. They travel long distances in search of food. Some of the dolphins are also territorial. So in Goa, for example, we have got a species of dolphin called the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin, which is also available in Goa. And they live just near the river, waiting for catching the small fish which come there. And also the range is almost like 40 square kilometers. So they uh, go around looking for food or playing in that about that area. You can see an inquisitive sea, a sea lion here. They're very, very sweet. And in some places they even interact with divers by coming and gently nibbling on their fins. So they're really cute. So in finding Nemo, how is Marlin related to Nemo? So Marlin is Nemo's dad, but like I told you, the dominant males can actually change into a female. I think I said it the other way around earlier, I'm sorry. Uh, so Ma Marlin could actually have been Nemo's mom. It could have gone either way. Yeah. So that's an amazing fact about Nemo. So why do we need to save the oceans? Yeah. Right now, we are seeing a lot of climate change, and that is affecting our lives. Just two days ago, there were very, very high winds and torrential rains in Dubai and the Middle East, which is unheard of at this time of the year. So all these uh, climate change uh, phenomena, which are taking place all over the world, is actually affecting not only humans, but it's also affecting all the marine life and terrestrial life quite a lot. And it's creating havoc. Yeah. So current ocean currents, which are like conveyor belts going all the way between the poles from the Arctic to the Antarctic, are also getting disrupted, which is creating major problems for the oceans. So oceans also maintain the water cycle. Right? A drop of water remains for nine days in a cloud. 
two hours in a river and 5,000 years in the ocean before it completely evaporates again. So that's a lot of exchange of water, but over a very long period of time. Yeah, Oceans also produce oxygen. So you may not know, but 70% of the uh, oxygen, which is available for us for breathing, actually comes from the oceans. It doesn't come from trees, as we generally believe. So if we do not take care of the oceans, we will not have enough oxygen to breathe. And so we will not be able to survive as a species. Oceans also connect all the continents. So they help in moving goods between countries, which is so useful for important for us. And remember, even though the flights also transport all kinds of goods and services, they will not be able to serve the full needs of us because transport by air is very expensive compared to trans uh, transport by the ships. Okay? Many of us eat fish, so the oceans are a huge source of fish, even though they are not infinite. And until now, we recent, until recently, we always believed that fish were so abundant that we could continue to kill and eat fish. But actually, it's not true. All the sources of food are drying up, including the fish. For example, the commercial varieties of fish, the tuna, etc., are actually getting very, very rare now. And because of overfishing, we have taken out so many of these fish that it is now believed that even the remaining fish, they will not be able to have enough breeding stocks in order to survive in the long run. This is so sad. Yeah. So oceans are a source of food, but we must not take undue advantage of them and kill more than what is necessary because that will mean that everything will vanish. Oceans also provide us with a lot of fun. For example, if you turn around in, uh, uh, for example, places like all the coastal places, Goa and all along, there's a lot of water sports. So when you go on holiday, you go and enjoy water sports. You enjoy scuba diving, you enjoy snorkeling, you enjoy, uh, for example, paragliding, parasailing. All these activities are available near the shore. And they also help a lot to recycle the waste. So all the rubbish that we are throwing into the oceans, even the carbon which is created by us and our activities of uh, pollution, like manufacturing things, everything gets absorbed by the oceans to a large extent. So you can see why oceans are very, very important. So why, what threats do the oceans face? You've seen the beauty, now we will see everything that you're thinking of, like ocean acidification and uh, lack of overfishing, sorry, overfishing, so many things. But let's look at the major threats that are affecting. Now, this looks like quite a funny picture, but when you think about the fact that animals have to deal with plastic underwater, it's quite sad because they will start absorbing the microplastics, not only in their food, in the open ocean, and also from their food. Uh, it's very sad because they their bodies will get polluted with the microplastics, which is really horrible. You can see this plastic pollution in this. Of course, you have a variety of things, including plastic and also but plastic by far is the biggest culprit. So if you go to, for example, uh, if you order a Swiggy, you will get it with a lot of single-use plastic, like plastic spoons, paper, pl paper plates or plastic plates, uh, stuff like that, which, of course, is single-use. You use it once and you throw it away, and it ends up in the oceans. Because when you throw it in the rivers, the rivers brings it to the uh, bigger rivers and then find it in the oceans. And then it's terrible to see what is happening out there. It is believed now that by the year 2050, there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fish. It's horrible, isn't it? And also, the oceans are getting carpeted with uh, microplastics, which you can't even see. So right now, a lot of us 
actually have microplastics in our bodies. And that is the sad part of the oceans. When they get that small, the plastic cannot even be collected and brought back to the oceans. Okay, so it's very, very bad state of affairs. You can see here in the right, upper right photograph, a turtle, the favorite food for turtles is jellyfish. So the turtle here is mistaking the glass, the plastic glass for plastic, uh, for jellyfish and he's going to eat it. And what will happen? Of course, he cannot digest it. So it will go down into his stomach and it will not digest. As a result of which, the turtle will slowly go on to starvation diet and he will actually die over a long period of time, very, very painfully, because even though he will be hungry, he will not be able to eat. Okay? That's really sad. You see, in this one little bird, there are so many different types of plastic. So it's really sad that all this is going inside the bird and he cannot digest it. So obviously, eventually, he'll die. Similarly, oil spills and chemical pollutants are really, really bad for the ocean. So when oil spills, and it's happening practically every day, in some part of the world, it initially floats on the surface and then it will form a layer on top, like the first di uh, first photograph, where it will dis start dissolving slowly and the chemicals that cause this will cause acidification and other, other problems, which will eventually the whole oil slick will sink, sink into the sea and it's uh, going to smother everything under water. Okay. So in this, you can see some of the photographs are from the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill, which was a huge oil spill containing millions of dollars of uh, millions of uh, barrels of oil, which covered all the animals like this little bird here, which uh, had to have help because Indians and a lot of, I mean, uh, humans and a lot of scientists and cleaning teams had gone up to these sites and cleaned each and every bird, each and every animal, which actually was affected by this and, you know, suffered because of that. Many, of course, died, many millions, like this dolphin right here. Uh, when you see the picture of a polar bear, it usually looks very fat and fluffy. But here it's looking actually very, very weak. And that is also because of climate change, because the ice caps and the glaciers are all melting. And he cannot stay here until everything is, you know, I mean, uh, when the oil, uh, the uh, ice melts, it creates a very big problem for the polar bears because they have to go further and further into the sea to actually find their food. And it's a big struggle for survival for them. If you look at the bottom picture, you can see a thriving coral reef on the left-hand side, but the same coral has bleached completely at the surface because of the ocean temperatures going up. And it's quite likely that this will not survive because if the bleaching is for a very short period of time, then the coral can recover. But if it bleaches and remains like that with the ocean temperature remaining high for very long, then the corals will all die and they will not come back to life. Number four is overfishing. And we talked about shark finning earlier. The 90%, it is estimated, the 90% of all big fish, which are actually eaten by us as well as big predators are already gone. So, for example, the bluefin tuna, the yellowfin tuna are overfished to an extent that it's very difficult for them, if not impossible, to recover to the old uh, numbers that they had in the past. So, I was telling you earlier that 100 million sharks are killed. You can see all these, uh, in the, quite a few of these photographs, all the fins are drying, which have been cut from living sharks. So you can see at the bottom here, most of the fins are cut when the animals are still alive. And if the sharks do not have fins, 
they sink to the bottom of the ocean, they drown and die. So how sad is that? They are still alive, but they cannot swim, so they are dying slowly and painfully. Now the first photograph here uh, on the bottom left is of a trawler which you, used to look like the trawlers I used to see when I first came to Goa in 95. You can see there used to be so many fish at that time. But they're becoming rarer and rarer because the trawlers are cleaning them out. They're cleaning much more than they need. A lot, and it will be shocked to know, almost 70% of the catch of the fish in big trawlers is actually washed back into the ocean alive or dead because they are not the target species. A lot of the fish actually are useless for the fishermen. So they discard them into the oceans, which is just senseless death. Ghost net fishing is on number five. A lot of the fishing nets used by small fishermen are discarded in the ocean when they become redundant. That means they're they're not able to use them again. For example, they get caught in coral reefs or on shipwrecks where they cannot be pulled up from. So the fishermen just throw the rest of the net into the sea where they are just floating uh, without targeting any particular fish and everything that gets caught in their dives. It's very sad. So you can see here the first photograph has got a net which has been thrown around the shipwreck and they're catching like even the crabs and the uh, corals which and they cannot remove the net anymore so just leave it, they abandon it. Here in the second photograph, you can see a, a net which has actually gone around the neck of a sea lion. This is really sad because, you know, for example, even if we go diving underwater and we see this, we will not be able to catch the animal because they are very, very fast. So only on the beach, we can hope to catch them and then remove the net because this will become tighter and tighter and will eventually kill the animal. So fish which are caught in nets or mammals which are caught in nets lead die a very painful death because they starve for years and years and years before they can actually die. So how can you as an individual make a difference? You know, our problems sound so big. So you'll be asking yourself, how can I help? Because I'm only one person, right? So some of the things that you can reduce, recycle, repurpose, or reduce, sorry. Uh, so you can actually carry washable cups wherever you go. If you know that you're going to have food outside, you can carry your own empty plastic bottles. You can even refill that. When you go to the restaurant, you can tell them to wash it, refill it. Uh, or stop using all single-use plastics, which you're going to use only once and then throw away. Re you refuse store bags. If they give you plastic bags, tell them, please, I don't want it. And request them to keep reusable bags, which people will definitely buy okay, uh, for a few rupees. Recycle. Don't throw away anything that can be recycled. Aluminum cans, cardboard, electronic equipment. Yeah, the, everything can actually be recycled. But remember, there is a cost to recycle. It uses a lot of energy to recycle all these items. So preferably get it uh, into a recycling center, which does this on a big scale, and they'll be able to do it in a much more efficient fashion than us. Now, waste. Each of us generates a lot of waste. How, you ask, okay? So we are all, a lot of us are impulsive buyers, so we'll buy a lot of stuff which we don't need, and then we will get rid of it because we think we don't need it. But the shelf life of that item might be quite a lot. So it will really survive a long period of time and we'll continue to uh, slowly let out microplastics, which as you know, is not good for us. How do we reduce waste? That is the most important one because whenever you go to a shopping mall or to a fishing market, you have to first think whether we actually need that item which we are trying to buy. Yeah? 
So in most of the cases, you'll find an I, a, the answer for you saying, no, we don't need them. Yeah. So you can avoid a lot of impulsive, buy, impulsive buying by thinking of it. Secondly, start making wise packaging choices. For example, it's your birthday and you're used to your friends coming over and giving you nice, lovely presents, which are wonderfully colored paper. Yeah. Now, all the paper which is available is not actually good for the environment because it takes a lot of energy to make these papers, very shiny papers, which look good on your presents, but actually which are a nightmare for the folks. So try to tell all your friends, your relatives, whoever, if they're coming to visit you, to please not give you presents. And if they are going to give you presents, then just please give it in the shape of a, uh, I mean, in uh, non-plastic packaging and non-biodegradable, uh, biodegradable packaging. So try to get them to follow uh, at least some sustainable practices. Yeah. Say no to plastic. I know it has become a part of our lives. But if you can, try and avoid at least some of the types of plastic. Like we, Everywhere we go, we end up buying bottled water. So if you have your own bottle, then you can take it with you. You can filter the water and drink it. It is becoming more and more common now uh, all over the world. In fact, even in India. But keep, on, keep in mind that you need to carry this. Same way, do not buy single-use plates, straws, earbuds, cotton brushes, etc. because all this will be a problem for degrading. So please even go to the uh, shops and tell them, we need, give us paper bags instead of plastic ones, give us jute bags instead of regular bags. Okay. Spread awareness among local shops and uh, you know, spread the message between your among your friends, your relatives, anybody you can talk to. People want to help and they want to do things, but sometimes they don't know where to go. Yeah, Encourage manufacturers of paper plants. So paper bags, sorry, by donating old newspapers, magazines, et cetera, so they can be reused and made paper bags. Okay. Raise your voice. I think most of you have heard of Greta Thunberg, who uh, lives in uh, Scandinavia and she's become a big voice for conservation. So you too can become like that in your own neighborhood. You don't have to become a global voice, but at least you can help by sharing all this information on your uh, Instagram, on your Facebook, whatever social media you're choosing to use among your friends, among your relatives, among your friends, uh, acquaintances even. Yeah. So the more you spread the awareness, the more people will learn about it and hopefully follow it. Okay. So you can also ask the government to make the changes that you want to see. You see? So again, your voice will make a lot of difference. In that. You can talk to the local politicians, you can talk to the leaders who are the main guys in your area and they will listen to you and they will make a huge difference. So remember that you can keep talking about it, but you need to do something about it. Do not treat the rivers and oceans as a garbage dump, right? In India, there's a serious problem that when people see other people throwing rubbish everywhere, they'll also follow without thinking about what's going to happen or not. Okay? So try to be better than that. Do not buy marine fish from unauthorized dealers or sellers because those fish will die very soon, which the, you, they get from the fish. Okay? Eat seasonal fruits for, and vegetables which are local in nature, not in the supermarket. You can buy bread, vegetables, you can buy uh, fruits, you can buy so many things locally. If you start importing all the food, etc., the carbon footprint of that food is very, very big. That means you have to take into account all the uh, fuel that has been used to bring that product to your neighborhood and also 
uh, it's a lot of waste in terms of resources. Uh, if you buy and support the local sellers, then you are supporting the local economy, which is so much better. Okay, save electricity by turning off lights and appliances when you leave the room. Very simple thing each and every one of us can do. When you're going out of the room, please turn off the lights because nobody's there, right? So turn it off and also appliances. If you are, for example, using an AC in the room, please turn it off. If you are watching a TV, you can also turn that off when you're done with it and you're leaving the room. So try to be a part of the solution, not the problem, not a part of the problem. You can find a lot of like-minded people who are in your school, in your colleges, to discuss all these points with. Right now, I think a lot of you studying in schools are also following the UN program of SDG 14. Sorry, Sustainable Development. And the very important ones that relate to the underwater problem is the SDG 14. Okay, so I'm sure you guys are being educated about that in schools. Find an organization you can join with like-minded people. And so then you will find that you're not alone. There's so many people who are facing the same thing that they maybe they don't have the information or they don't have the local organization to go to. So you can join them and then your hands are more strengthened when you are working with different people, different organizations. So you can actually think about the global problems, but then it becomes a bit overwhelming. You need to actually think about the problems which are in your neighborhood and try to solve those problems, which will be so much easier to deal with. Okay. What do we do? So every year for almost 26 years, we used to organize beach and underwater cleanups. In fact, there is one beach cleanup and underwater cleanup which is coming up on the following Sunday, not the coming Sunday, but the following Sunday. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, you're audible, Vankar. Well, I've lost power, so it might go. Yeah. I'll keep talking. Yeah. So we, we invite local people, local students, and everybody to join us for these cleanups. And we go to the local beach, which is on the island, which nobody else cleans. So we go there and we do the cleanup. And you can see in the first photograph how many bags of rubbish we have collected. And we are collecting it in jute bags, which are biodegradable. So we don't take... ...a difference, at least on one day, right? So we have young children, we have comes and tries to make a difference on that day. You can see we also free sharks and fish, crabs, etc., from ghost nets. So we actually find them and then release them, and hopefully they're alive at that time, obviously. So this is a shark which I freed on a night time. So you can see the line which has destroyed his mouth, but ho but he did swim away. So hopefully he has survived. These are surveys that we do. You can see him laying a tape here. So we do surveys to find out what are the different types of corals, fish, etc., in different parts of the island that we are diving on regularly. We also go to different areas where we actually do surveys for the scientists to help them to understand how we can help the local uh, environment. So this, these are some of our projects that we do. We do permanent mooring boys so that uh, boats which go to specific tourist destinations don't drop their anchors and damage the environment. So they can actually tie off to the mooring boys so that they don't drop the anchor and damage it. Second one is the coral transplantation, which we do on tiles. We take small pieces of coral, like you can see here on the right hand side and we grow them to a sufficient size so that after they grow bigger then we take them and put them on the actual reef to increase the size of the reefs okay uh, we are also looking at doing edna biodiversity surveys so this is a very interesting topic where we take only a five liter sample of the water 
in a particular area at the surface and even at the bottom. And then we put it through a lab process and identify all the different animals which leave their DNA in the water. So we are able to identify so many different species in this very advanced way. So how long does plastic take to, take to decompose? I think you will guess it's the highest number of years, which is a thousand years. So the first bit of plastic, which was actually created or uh, manufactured in 1907, is still very much around on this planet, which is so sad. Yeah. Which of the following can be recycled? All of the above can be recycled. Yeah. So, but like I said, it takes a lot of energy in terms of fossil fuel to recycle all this. So the best thing is to reduce what you're doing, not recycle. So we invite you to come and join us on our next beach cleanup, which is one week away from tomorrow. So try and get in touch with us, which you can, uh, all the contact details are given here. The best, best way is to actually send us an email and I don't know whether there are enough places left because we take very limited people for the cleanups, but you can try. If you are especially living in Goa, it's so much easier for you to join us. Okay, so I'll stop sharing the screen now. I hope you enjoyed the content and I'm open to questions, whatever you want to ask. Yeah, thank you, Vankat. Uh, we're opening the floor to questions now, so you can either leave them in the chat box or you can raise your hands to ask your questions. And if we get disconnected, I will go on a different uh, uh, platform. So bear with me. I'll take a few minutes to sign on again. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Actually, Vankat, I wanted to ask you to talk to people a little bit about how they can contribute to coastal impact in general. I know you brought up the beach cleanup on the 28th. But also, right. thank you for asking me that. Yeah. Because you reminded me about our coral adoption program. So, right now, sitting at home, you can actually adopt a fragment of coral, a piece of coral, for one year. And it's not very expensive, it's only 5,500 rupees for one fragment. Uh, we can't actually send you the fragment. We take care of it and we use the money that you use for adopting the piece of fragment by taking care of it for one whole year. So we actually go down and Gunjan knows this very well. She also volunteers with us. We go down and we clean the tiles on which the uh, corals are stuck and take care of it so that it grows big. Every month we go there and we actually clean the coral and then take it after one year and put it on the actual reefs. So it can be your ba little baby. You can name it after your friend, your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, whoever. And we will send you a little certificate which will say that you have adopted the coral in the name that you have chosen for it for one whole year. Yeah. And you will also, your parents will also get a tax break. So a certain percentage of the amount that you donate will also be subject to tax exemption. You can ask them more about it to become more clear on it. You as a diver, if you're already a certified scuba diver, you can come and join us in a program called Coral Crusaders. Sorry, uh, Coral Crusaders is the one which is for the coral uh, adoptions. There is one more program called uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the certified divers. You can actually come here and dive with us and do a survey and we teach you everything about the marine life, how to identify the fish, how to identify the corals. So you get the benefit of learning much more about the environment that you so much, that you so love. If you're not a diver, not to worry. You can come to us, spend four days and get certified as a scuba diver. And we can then take you for the program, which is uh, the, uh, to, to do the survey program that I talked about. Yeah? yeah. The survey program is called Marine Monitors, right? Marine monitors. Yes, yeah. correct. Right. Okay. Uh, we have a question in the chat box from Tarushi. She's asking, are there ways in which artists, designers, and educators living in Goa or outside of Goa can help out or volunteer at Coastal Impact? 
So you will need to send us an email and you will need to tell us what you're good at. There are a lot of people who don't physically have to come to Goa because I know it's difficult for people to come and spend months here. But even if you're outside Goa, anywhere in the world, in fact, you can help us by, for example, uh, creating posts for social media, which I know all you youngsters are so good at and I'm so bad at, right? So Gujjan also helps us with that. And we have almost like 15 volunteers who are certified divers who also come and help us underwater to do the cleaning, to do surveys, etc. So it depends on what skills you have, right? So you can actually tell us and then we can work out a, a way that you can actually help us. Uh, Gunjan helped us to organize a program at MOCA recently to make a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, what is that? Uh, from Plaster of Paris, I think it was, right? Yeah. Really where you cool. made different yeah. structures of uh, marine life, of coral, etc. It was so beautiful. And everybody learned that from one of our marine biologists who's, who's working with us. And everybody had a blast doing it. But when you do this, you also learn the details that go into each figure that you make, which are actually, uh, which make you more aware of the beauty of nature. So that was a super hit, I think. And thank you, Gwendolyn, for organizing that. It's great. That was very fun. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So we'll bring the session to an end. And before I do that, I have a few thank yous to make. So first of all, to you, Vankat. I think the oceans are a very, very important part of our lives. And we learned so much through this talk today. I'm sorry about my dog. Uh, and also, a very big thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. Uh, and making this a really nice, fun, interactive session. We hope to see you next month for our Heritage Hour session. And thank you so much for joining us. I just have one thing to add. I don't need your thanks. But my biggest thanks would be for each and every one of you to start doing something to protect the environment, whether it is the marine environment or whether you want to do something in your own city, in your own village, like tackling the garbage problem, the plastic problem, whatever you want to do, please, please, please go ahead and make a difference. Thank you so much for being a patient audience. Take care and have fun. See you. Bye. Thank you. See you.